Like many other familiar carols, as with gladness, Men of Old was first written as a poem, this time by an insurance agent, William Chatterton Dix. Uh, he was a lay member of a church in Bristol, England, and we go back to the day, January 6, 1860. And Dix uh, is in bed. He's been in bed for a month with an illness. And he had missed church that day. It was the Epiphany service where they recount the story of the wise men. And not wanting to miss out on worship, they didn't have an opportunity to watch online like we do, obviously. He took the time to read the text that they would be reading in church that day. We're going to do that right now. It's from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Well, January 6th, 1860, after uh, Dix had read this verse, he began to write out some words in response to it. And by the end of the day, he had completed his poem, As With Gladness, Men of Old, exactly as we see it before us today. So we're going to take a, a, a time to look at that, uh, this wonderful poem turned into a carol as a way to get us back into this text of Scripture. Now, as with Gladness, Men of Old, is really in two parts. There's stanzas one through three, and then four and five. But we're going to spend a lot of our time in one through three, uh, because that is a, this, a, those stanzas are about the story of the wise men. Now, instead of just recounting their journey, Dix cleverly draws us into the story by means of analogy. Notice that each of the first three stanzas begins with the word as, and he describes a part of the wise men's journey. So on, if you've printed out your outline in those first three stanzas, um, circle the word as. And then notice halfway through the stanza, he completes the analogy with the word so. Take a moment and find out where that is on those first three stanzas and circle that as well. As so, as so. And the logic of these first three stanzas is, is this. Just as the wise men did long ago, so may we do the same today. As the wise men did long ago, so may we do the same today. Which means that there is built-in applications in this carol. It's not just a story. It's a story and what we should do in light of this story. And these applications are incredibly challenging if we will take 
the time to consider them. So let's take a closer look at the first of the three stanzas. Stanza one tells us about the journey the wise men took to follow a star. It's all about their journey. As with gladness men of old did the guiding star behold, as with joy they hailed its light, leaning, leading onward, beaming bright. Now the men of old were the magi, the wise men. They were uh, astrologers, pagan sky watchers. And as they watched the sky, there was an unusual star that had some kind of special meaning or significance to them. And it was a way that God spoke to them in, 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 in a unique way that they could understand. And it was through the beaming brightness of this Bethlehem star. And they responded to this star. They responded to God's leading. And they set out on a long journey to find the one for whom this star shone. Matthew testifies about this in his gospel. In verse 2, he writes, We saw his star when it rose and have come. Now, it's possible that the Magi may have staked their reputation and, and wealth on this venture, chasing after the star. And yet notice the language of joy in the journey. Dix writes, with joy they hailed its light. Now this isn't him taking creative license here. In verse 10, we read uh, in Matthew's gospel, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They see the star, they're, they're overjoyed to follow it, to make this discovery of who, who is on the other end. And Dix uses this ancient joyful journey as an example for us in pursuing Christ. He writes, So, remember our as so, So most gracious God, may we evermore be led to thee. So Dix is praying that we too might be drawn to God, that we too may be led into his holy presence. Now that sounds charming, but... We don't have a star like the wise men, right? So, so what are we going to do? What, what do we have to follow that will draw us into God's presence? Well, we actually have something far better and, and far more accurate and reliable. We have God's word. God's word is the star that guides us today. It is what leads us to the Lord. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And I love those last few words, kind of the connection that God's word is a, is a light to our path. It, it shines on the direction we should go. And truly, the pages of the Bible lead us to an, an encounter with the living God. You know, we meet the Lord in the pages of this book. This is where we meet him and we find out who he is and what he is like and what he has done from creation to salvation, from the beginning of time to the far reaches of eternity ahead. And the pages of this book, just like that star, will lead us right to him. It takes us right to the doorstep of Jesus Christ. And there is nothing like this book in the whole world that will lead us to the Lord. Just a final word on this star that they followed. You know, it wasn't like a they had like some secret ability that they were the only ones who could see this star, like they had special glasses on or something. Everyone else who took time to look up at the night sky saw this star, but, but it had no value to them. They, they it had no meaning for them. They, they weren't interested in it. And as they saw it move, they, they didn't follow it. And as a result, they never found Jesus. And the same is true for our Bibles. It is meaningless to us if we do not open its pages and follow its leading. If we do not read this book, we will not meet Jesus. Stanza 2. 
Just as the, the first stanza told us about the journey, stanza two tells us what happened when they arrived at their destination. What happened when they arrived? Dix writes, as with joyful steps they sped to that lowly cradle bed, there to bend the knee before him whom heaven and earth adore. As, as they sped to the cradle with joyful and determined steps, they pushed hard to keep pace with the movement of the star, likely over a period of months, first to Jerusalem, then to Bethlehem, until it led them to the doorstep of Jesus Christ. Now imagine when they showed up, it must have been some knock at the door. Can you imagine a knock on a door and uh, Mary in the back room yells to Joseph, Joseph, who is it? <laughs> you know, uh, you'll never guess. Like, what an interesting uh, moment that would have been. These were surprising visitors to say the least. Mary and Joseph were not expecting a delegation of wise men coming from a distant land to knock on their door. But just as surprising is, as, as their arrival is their response to the child Jesus. Dix writes, they were there to bend the knee. Matthew writes in verse 11, And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. <laughs> they worshipped him. Perhaps what makes them truly wise men is that upon coming to the house, they realized there was something going on that was far greater than what would meet the eye, right? Because as, as they cast their gaze down upon a poor infant in a very humble and meager home, they still willfully and joyfully bowed down and worshipped him and the language here is is of God. They worship him as God as best they could understand. Now, using the wise men again as a model, Dix continues with so, so may we with willing feet ever seek thy mercy seat. The mercy seat is a place in the Old Testament. It's a uh, on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. It was a place of God's presence, and it was a place where God was he, he's known as He was holy, and it was untouchable. It was, it was then placed in a temple. It was a place of worship. You, you would, um, you would bow down and you would worship God in His near presence as He sat on this mercy seat. And so Dix encourages us to seek out God with willing feet, eager feet, to worship Him. No hesitation, no resistance, no delay. To worship him. And worship means more than the songs we sing in church on a Sunday. There's no sense of the wise men singing or doing anything like that. Worship really means submission. It's about putting the Lord first above everything else in your life. It's about putting him first. You know, the first two commandments we have from the Lord are to worship the Lord and to put nothing else before him, not to bow down anything else, but to worship the Lord and to put nothing else before him. So this, this story of the wise men and, and, and this carol makes us wonder what place does Christ truly have in our life? Is he, is he our Savior? Is, have, have we um, trusted in him with our eternal destiny and to wash away our sins? And I hope so. I hope you've made it uh, that decision in your life. But, but this gets at the question of, is he your Lord? Are you allowing him to direct your steps? And are you willfully and joyfully bending the knee and submitting to his presence and his leading in your life? Because the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus is either first in your life and he's directing all things or he's not. And, and something else is first in your life. And whether it's yourself or another person or a dream or a goal or an ambition or whatever it is, it is a false star 
and you are following something that is leading you away from Jesus. Now, we know that Jesus is worth being first. He is worthy because of his nature, because of his perfection, uh, his almighty power, his holiness, his eternal being. He is worthy because of his character, that he is infinite in his love and in his grace and his mercy and his truth and his kindness. He is worthy because of all he has done in becoming a man and spilling his blood on the cross, that he would lay down his life to ransom the soul of sinners. And he is worthy for what he gives us, the gift of eternal life and a a place in his glorious kingdom. He is worth it all. And how much greater our joy should be and must be and can be in in worshiping Christ and submitting to him than, than those magi could have ever known and could have ever experienced. Stanza three, as we move on, we, we had the journey and then we had the, the, the arrival at the destination in the worship. And then stanza three tells us about the extravagant gifts they gave to Jesus. As, as they offered gifts most rare at that cradle, rude and bare. Now here, <coughs> excuse me, Dix is alluding to that familiar verse in Matthew where he writes, Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now these gifts were all rare. They were all very expensive. They were the kind of gifts reserved for royalty, which explains that's why they showed up at the palace in Jerusalem. They thought they were going to be giving gifts to royalty. You know, it's so striking, the the contrast of the poverty of the home in which they found Jesus and the lavish and expensive gifts they were offering to him. But just as they were not dissuaded by the humble surroundings and they knelt down and they worshiped Jesus, they did the same with their gifts. Um, It didn't matter how poor and lowly the surroundings were, they were going to give it all to Jesus. They were going to return home with empty pockets and and, and they would do no other thing. Now, once again, Dix encourages us to follow the example of the wise men with so. (laughs) So may we with holy joy, joy in the giving, pure and free from sin's alloy. All our costliest treasures bring. Christ to thee, our heavenly King. The word alloy is in there, and uh, we don't probably use that word a whole lot in regular terminology, and certainly not in our hymn singing. But an alloy, if you remember from your days of chemistry, it's a mixture of two things. It's when you get two objects, usually two metals, and a greater one is then mixed with a lesser one. So what Dix is getting at here, when it comes to giving our treasures to Jesus, we have this part of our devotion, but then there's this alloy, and and, and our gift giving gets mixed with our sinful nature. Things like pride and selfishness and a desire for comfort or for fun or for status. And so when these things kind of come together, our, our heart for the Lord and our sinful nature, it's this, it's this alloy that's it's lesser than. And it leaves us then, when it, with gift giving to Christ, unwilling, big grudging, half-hearted, tight fitness, tight-fisted, with as much joy as paying taxes. But Dick says, no, we give with holy joy, unreserved joy in who we are giving the gift to. And in light of Christ and and who he is and what he has done, can we give him a gift 
apart from pure joy? And is there anything too great or too costly to lay at his feet? The, the Magi gave extravagant, lavish gifts. And yet, how much more do we know of Christ than the Magi? They only knew him by the star. They knew nothing of his life, that he would give sight to the blind, that he would raise the dead, that he would walk on water. They knew nothing of the cross and the tomb, that he would offer his life as an exchange for sinners, and that he would give them uh, an invitation to eternity. They knew nothing of the grace and mercy he would extend and how he would attend to his own even today throughout time, throughout thousands of years, with tenderness and care. So when we think of it, compared to the wise men, how much greater our affection for Christ it must be, and how much greater our gratitude, and how much greater our joy in the giving. And when I think of my own life, in terms of giving, whether it was, you know, um, money or life decisions, whatever the, the treasure was, you know, plans, ambitions, it doesn't matter. I can tell you, I have never once regretted giving to the Lord. It has always been, um, in the moment and in reflection, joy. And I've taken great delight in it. The only regret I have had is when I haven't given or haven't given to the degree that I felt like maybe I should have. That's when kind of that alloy got in my life. It has always brought me great joy to show Christ my love and my trust for him and to say, yes, Lord, I love you and everything is yours. Let me show you my devotion. And I know that many in our church know that and many in our church also know that regret of, of holding back and, and not giving as we should. And so Dix leads us again through, their, through this journey, but then also the journey we take as disciples in following Christ. He concludes the, the carol in stanzas four and five uh, as, as we conclude our message. Now, there's a shift here. There's a, uh, there's a meaningful break. And in, in stanzas four and five, the scene shifts from a, the nativity scene of Jesus' birth to the heavenly realm, kind of our, all that's going to happen after, after our life. Notice this. And we'll take these verses, these stanzas together. Holy Jesus, every day, keep us in the narrow way. And when earthly things are past, when our life is over, Bring our ransom lives at last, where they need no star to guide, where no clouds thy glory hide. In that heavenly country bright, need they no created light, thou its light, its joy, its crown, thou its sun, which goes not down. Therefore forever may, there forever may we sing, Alleluia to our King. So we, we, we shift from history of 2,000 years ago into now eternity in the heavenly realm. But there's another shift there, and I don't know if you caught that, but the imagery of guiding, this guiding light changes. And the, the physical light that led the wise men, that star, it's no longer needed because we are in his full presence and Christ in glory radiates his glory in front of us, before us. And it says Christ is its light. He is the sun which does not go down. And there is no need for created light because Christ is the light. And in that heavenly realm, we will see him face to face as he truly is, not as a child wrapped in flesh and in humble surroundings, but we'll behold him as he truly is in the glorious radiance as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Alpha and Omega and the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, the Prince of Peace. And we will behold him and be warmed by the light of of his glorious radiance as it shines for all eternity. That's how this story ends. And that's the point of all of it. That's the point. 
That is why you and I have been led and drawn to come to Jesus in faith. And it's why we continue to follow him every day of our lives so that like the men of old, we may one day arrive at the door of his heavenly home and when we knock, be welcomed in and delight in his presence and worship him forever.